My love life began in the apartment below ours when I was five, while our mothers drank weak Irish tea in the parlor. Dishwater, my grandmother called it, contemptuous of the Depression era practice of making two cups of tea from one tea ball. The landlady's daughter Maureen, worldly at six, took my hand and led me under her kitchen table, and hidden by the tablecloth, began to peel the onion of the flesh and reveal to me, reveal it to me, using the classic, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> by kindergarten, I'd become totally smitten with Joan, a scrawny scarecrow with brunette braids and large blue glasses. She would haunt my thoughts all the way to graduation. <coughs> And from then forward, I remained unreasonably addicted to girls and women who wear glasses. <laughs> My first actual love friend, Kathy, a short, barely keen Polish maiden with mousy brown hair and ankles that spindled and tottered in heels she wasn't entirely skilled at wearing, led us electrifyingly from innocence to experience. Most every afternoon, we climbed behind a curtain of florid teen lust in her apartment trying our damnedest to crawl into each other's skin, while her mother, who had a night job, slept across the hall. We loved each other unreasonably for a while and had the abrasions to bear living witness. I close this chapter of my young love novella by leaving her without ceremony to create a place for Daria, who was destined to become my first wife. I returned to the practice of virginity again as I patiently strove to corrupt her romantically over the next year. We learned from each other that love is a biting of the fig with the pleasure of warm juices rolling down our hot faces in the baking sun. Also I learned that to hold is often more compelling than to have, a lesson that would continue to scatter bad seed across the tilled field of my existence for decades to come. I found that I wasn't designed to love well, or at all, and that love, given time, just wore away like a river bottom stone, traveling downstream until it quietly washed into the sea. Yet, there was a streaking comet that crashed unexpectedly into the atmosphere along the equator during a midnight swim in Singapore, and faith in love began again. Three years of meeting Helene in towns all over the globe but almost never in New York. Love that spilled out loudly and wonderfully messy, but was never set to words. And we accepting the unfairness of belonging to others and walking away like mute, blind strangers. My take on it all, at least I had loved, really loved once, and so I could pack it up and pack it in. Love became like a long and nearly total eclipse of the world's light. But the relationships God had other plans for me. After the demise of that marriage and the riotous bachelorhood that ensued, I saw across the room one evening this person in frizzed big hair, a severely dark raincoat, and totally serious glasses. <laughs> Looking at her drove me to such curiosity, and her measured disinterest further provoked me out beyond the safe swim area. The chase began. Robin claims I chased her endlessly until I threw all caution to the breezes and caught up with her. I got that my ambivalence looked extremely foolish, and so, and just so, the flames that soon surrounded us were fanned by acres of dead grasses. It takes a burned prairie a long time to reveal the first hints of new growth and regeneration. The wound is thoroughly cauterized in the fire but the ground poison needs to be carried away by the winds before new growth is comfortable showing itself. The wait has been so very interesting. <laughs>